Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Cube Pod, episode 25, breaking news. We are podcasting live on X, formerly Twitter, tweeting, podcasting, streaming, periscoping, whatever the hell they're going to call it on X. Dave Vellante and John Furrier for episode 25 of the Cube Pod. As we're rocking and rolling, Dave, we're streaming on X, formerly Twitter, at the Cube Handle. Thanks to Andrew and the team in the studio, the Super Studio, we're calling it, powering the Super Cloud, the Super Cube, the Super Cube Pod. Thanks to Elon Musk. Actually, Jason Kalkanis, always one pointing out the new feature. So thanks to Jason at Jason Kalkanis. Thanks for that, Dave. Kicking off episode 25, we got SuperCloud 4 scheduled in October. We got big events coming up. We got VMware Explorer next week, right after that, Google Next. Tons of news this week. So much happening yeah. in, in the, our world. Intel's deal falls apart. They scrapped the $5.4 billion acquisition of Tower Semiconductor. Stock is tumbling. I know you got an opinion. Uh, the Silicon Wars are at it again. Arm kicking ass. Cisco earnings came out. They came on very, very strong. Uh, looking very good there, as we had predicted and been covering at, like a blanket. Um, probably the best analyst group on the team right now is the Cube Research Group on Cisco. Databricks, by breaking news and the information today that they're doing another raise, that's actually not a real story. That's not accurate. So the information got it wrong and they're reporting. They're technically not raising money, but they're actually bringing money in. It's not a raise, it's a liquidity. I'll get into that later in my rant section, but certainly, again, another report. They kind of got it right, but didn't get it right. So no context there and accuracy. So we'll, we'll clarify the information's reporting on that. Gen AI hype is subsidizing, or is it just grandstanding or cluelessness? Gary Marcus weighs in, the king of AI in his mind, um, saying that AI is not hyped up what it be. He's talking about generative AI as an application. Um, I think he's missing the boat there, but I see his point. Everyone's trying to be the expert in AI, right? It's, it's fun to watch, actually. I'm the expert in AI, Dave. Or, you know, Dave. It's, it's, we're going to get into that in the rant section as well. The Lahaina tragedy in Maui continues to be sad tragedy story, and Terrible. that's ongoing. Um, it hits home in California because a lot of people go to Hawaii, and obviously everyone knows that's ever been on a honeymoon or a trip. Uh, I spent a lot of time there. Zia Carvella, our CUBE alumni and CUBE Collective member, was there and bought a shirt from the bike store there. He likes a big biker. It's gone the next day. It's so sad. And of course, we got exclusive story coming up with AWS CEO. We got the official news that we will get the scoop on getting Adam Selesky one on one prior to reinvent coming up in a few months. Um, just big fall coming up. Uh, the receding cybersecurity tide. Um, some are swimming naked, as Rob Hover, editor in chief, points. The AI universe continues. Gartner has finally labeled Gen AI in the hype cycle. <laughs> Dave, welcome to episode th uh, 25, <laughs> streaming live early, by the way. This is a preview. If you're on Twitter watching right now, give us a retweet. Um, this is a, a, did, yeah. a moment. Right. So good good to be here. Great, hey, John. great to kick off the pod. Yeah, good to be here. I appreciate you guys moving the schedule. I got a wedding to go to tomorrow, so I'm going to be hightailing it out of here right after we record breaking analysis. We're moving that up. So I'll be working late tonight, John. <laughs> it's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah. And, and look, so I can see, I can see the pod over there. Our, awesome to Elon for making that Twitter feature on X feature. But Dave, you know, a lot of going on in tech right now. I mean, I'm reading you know, the Wall Street Journal. I know you got your copy there this week. Some a lot of great stories. You know, the economic climate right now is interesting. Um, mortgage rates hit highest level in more than 20 years. Um, that's interesting. You got um, an interesting. Um, real estate market are they controlled by big big tech and big pe right now private equity a lot of discussion about that and then obviously the tech side continues to boom you know the ai thing um a lot of people kind of chiming in with the well it's not going to be that big of a deal you know there's a lot of total bs being floating around the marketplace right now on ai and i gotta say it's kind of fun at some level um, but it's the classic hype market a lot of um people come out of the woodwork and claim that they are ai gurus we saw this with social media. Remember the social media guru phase? Ah, we, John, John, we saw it with COVID. Remember, everybody <laughs> was a COVID expert overnight. Right? That's what we do. <laughs> so, so, so it's fun to watch. But you know, but the ones, but a lot of the stories they're missing the context. I mean, generative AI is the hottest thing. Okay, we've been using it, and actually, we're farther along with the Cube engineering team. We just had an all hands meet, meeting with our team and. Uh, Ken Libby and our team gave a great update on that, and that was we're actually way ahead of some of the other people in the marketplace, and we're just and, and we're just in by kind of be default. Um, so we're going to lean into that. The AI hype is legit. 
Okay, I'll just say this right now. The, the what people don't understand in these major market forces is an era of pop of, of wow magic. Um, they some people compare it to the iPhone moment. Um, you know, it's it's really not the iPhone moment. It's really something different. It's the, it's the web moment. It's the it's the moment of, of, of machine learning. Okay, and so I think what ChatGPT did is gave that magic. I call it the Harry Potter Potter moment. I think what what episode podcast day we were talking about the the magic of Harry Potter. You know, the, give the spell and all of a sudden the machine does something. I think it's not an iPhone moment, but that Harry Potter moment where people saw it and said, "Well, that's magic," and well, and it's over now. But the thing is, it's it is changing everything, and it will be infused in software. And we said that too on that episode. So I think a lot of people that are shooting from the hip, these so-called experts like Gary Marcus, don't get AI. Right? They don't well, they understand the operational impact of AI. And I, I mean that in, in not a pejorative way. He he probably knows AI academically, but he, he probably doesn't understand the operational aspect of it as well as like we do in terms of where we see companies investing in AI. Well, let's 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 tell people. Let's explain to people. So he uh, Gary Marcus, smart guy. He's he's a scientist. He's an author. You know, he's obviously you know a smart dude. Wrote an article um, on Substack. What if Gen AI turned out to be a dud? And he's got a picture of this it's big, a, and it's a question mark. This it's big, a, this big blimp. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so that's yeah. kind of okay. But the then blimp explodes. You know, yeah. and basically saying, hey, a lot of people think that there's well, they basically saying there's no revenue. And and I'll tell you, so we this is where. AI and generally and Gen AI specifically is going to make money. It's like <laughs> reducing labor costs. I've been saying this for a while. It's about cutting the need for labor because that's where most companies' expenses are. Yeah. And I, I don't care what anybody says. I know just know from personal experiences that Gen AI has made me more, more productive. It's actually, you know. <laughs> <laughs> the cube AI, we know this. We used to have a human doing all the clips. Now we have we have AI doing it. You push a button and the clips are better, right? And, and yeah. way, way higher volume, so it allows scale. Productivity numbers are actually up. I'm not yeah. sure output is up, but productivity is up. So I think we're gonna we're gonna come into a productivity boom. But again, it's not necessarily about the revenue and the direct monetization. It's about making organizations and people more productive. And that's gonna that's gonna be tr trillions of dollars of economic value, in my yeah. opinion. Yeah, Gary completely missed the missed the boat on this post. He completely doesn't understand the reality. He's comparing uh, LK99, that big hyped uh, semi superconductor thing, to the AI hype. And and the problem that would have been cool if it were true. <laughs> <laughs> I wish that was true. Actually, that, yeah. that I wish that would hype came reality. But the AI hype is happening. But we and actually we talked about it last podcast. We said that the earnings from AWS and Azure fell short on the AI side, specifically Azure and Microsoft. As you, we pointed out and discussed on that podcast episode, Microsoft didn't see the revenue. Why? Because there is no revenue yet. It's coming. This is the build-out phase of the Cambrian explosion. So this is the reality of AI. It is a Cambrian explosion for developers and new kinds of applications where the ones that innovate on that labor arbitrage that you're talking about or that benefit – are going to refactor their application. It's the same game, same so, application, just refactored. That's where the winners are. That's where AI will soar, and that's where you got to squint through the hype and BS and saying, how does it impact the top and bottom line? You'll see it right there in the efficiency. So, Benedict Evans in this, he, there's a tweet that that um, Marcus put in his post. He's saying, I don't want to, I don't want something that writes mediocre prose. The error rate means I can't use it for data. He says, I've been using ChatGPT 3.5 and 4 for half a year now. And really, I haven't worked out anything that's useful for me. I mean, I totally disagree. I, I just I do my breaking analysis today, right? I threw a bunch of data at at um at ChatGPT and I said, make this into a table. Right. Okay. And it just took all the ta the data yeah. and just made it into a beautiful table. It would have taken me at least twice as long to do that. And then I it did, it did a table and it wasn't that pretty. I said, give me some HD, HTML code to make this table pretty with colors. It gave me the HTML code. I did something else while it was it was generating that code. Yeah. I put it into my HTML editor and, and then boom. And I just copied, I just took a screenshot of the, the table, put it into my breaking analysis. It would have taken me, I don't know, maybe 20 minutes to do that if, if, if I had to do it myself. And it probably took me five minutes. It was... So I find I have hundreds of examples like that. Now maybe yeah. that's beneath, you know, Benedict Evans, yeah. right? He doesn't yeah. need that, but 
you know, I, I, I will say this. I do think ChatGPT's, I think Jeff Jonas is right, entropy is winning. I think it's getting, I do think in some ways it's getting worse, right? I think, but it still gives me good ideas, right? And it's and it's just, when I my, my brain is fried, I have it do something for me, like it's just grunt work, and I'm like, okay, good, I got this. So I, I disagree with that, that premise. Well, I mean, there's two sides of the story that I think are worth talking about. One is the inflated expectations of AI. Yeah, they're that's fair. They're definitely inflated. Yep. Okay, but the, the lack of utility is off. I agree with you 100%. The people who think there's no utility in this is ridiculous. And Evans, Evans knows better, by the way. So I know Benedict Evans is a great analyst, uh, very strong. He's like in that strategy kind of world. Um, he should know better than that, but he's obviously not doing a lot of writing. He's not doing, if he thinks there's no use to, utility for chat GPT 3.5 and 4, he's probably not doing anything useful. Um, and if he's listening to this, I'm happy to debate that anytime, because like you said, there are probably things that he could be more efficient if he was publishing. If he's looking to write letters to friends and emails and stuff, I can see his point. That's a wrong use case. He's just quote, my friends who tried to use chat GPT to answer search queries to help with academic research have faced similar disillusionment. Well, no shit. Don't use it for that. <laughs> a lawyer who used ChatGPT for legal research was excoriated by a judge and basically had to promise in writing never to do it again. Yeah, you're an idiot. That's not what it's there for. By the it's way, that's not that's not that's not Benedict Evans. That's Gar that's no, Gary. No, that's Gary Marcus. Gary Marcus, Marcus. right? Uh, yeah. yeah, thank Benedict you for clarifying Evans is, that. Is smart. That's no, thank business. you for clarifying that. But I mean, that's just yeah. that's the wrong use case. Yeah. yeah. Right. It's like. So if that's what you're using ChatGPT for, you're wasting your time. Use it for ideas. Yeah. Use it to get a first draft. Use it. You know what I use it for too? For sometimes I I miss things. Like you know, maybe I get four out of the six bullets that I'm supposed to have or six key points, and ChatGPT will give me ideas. Oh yeah, you know what? Maybe I missed that. Or ways to consolidate things. So yeah. I, yeah. I, I again I, 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 I use it all the time. I prepare for interviews. I just had an interview this morning. Uh, with an AI startup with the CEO, and I asked him, hey, what would give me some uh, topics you'd like to talk about? And he said, here's the topic I'd like to talk about, and here's some of my talking points. I essentially edited it out. I turned the, the, the talk into a question and his, and his talk track into answers, and I plugged it into chat GPT and said, write me a blog post essay on it. And it, it was unbelievable. So John, there was so you, zero hallucinations. How many interviews have you and I done in the last 13 years each? I don't know. Thousands. Maybe thousands. Five? 5,000, maybe more. I don't know. Yeah, I'm, so I'm definitely we, over 5,000 for sure. So, if not so when we do, and me too. Well, the, so Cube we, is, the Cube has done a total of 14,000 interviews. No, more than that. No, more than this. There's, there's almost 20,000 um, videos on our on our YouTube oh, channel. Oh, yeah, no, that's that guests. Those are, fifth, those are guests. Um, no, 18,000 okay. guests, 30, so, over 30,000 videos. So so here's the thing. So it's, I do the same thing. But when I, prior to ChatGPT, I would, you know, I would still do, spend a lot of time preparing for interviews thinking, researching, digging, you know, doing Google queries, et cetera. I will ask ChatGPT, give me some questions. You know, I'll ask it you know, for, to, to get me started. And it'll always come up with like two or three things that it would take me a while to think of. I might have got there, I might never have gotten there. And so then I edit it, I add my own, you know, words, I put it into my own tone. I think of things that yeah. ChatGPT may not know because I got you know tribal knowledge and and history, and I just find it to be a, a good helper. There's a lot of AI investments right now going on. The startup scene is still robust, even though there's one article out there I saw was the first one. It's like, oh, the VCs aren't into the seed rounds. You show me a VC that's not interested in AI seed round, I'll tell you a VC that's going to be out of a business. Yeah. <laughs> so it's like you know, it's like that is complete horseshit the story. Um, so the startup m market is hot. The prices might come down on valuations, given that some people are just, you know, rolling a front end to chat GPT. So there's a lot of head faking. But the v some of the VCs that are doing seed, they're smarter than that. So I, I think the seed investment will continue to be dominating uh, the coverage. Um, and absolutely more startups are going to jump in. This is a Cambrian explosion. I think, again, startups going to be booming. I said this to Swami in February at Amazon when I interviewed him. He agreed. This is a next-gen Amazon moment. AWS was built on the back of startups that the first-gen uh, in SaaS. I think the second generation of SaaS and platforms is going to be powered by AI. And there's no doubt in my mind, the cloud guys will be continuing to win. Um, only the spoils um, go to AWS, Azure, and Google, and maybe Oracle, who's coming up in a pretty good cloud move there. So cloud will win. But the market of white space for startups is going to be amazing. That's why I'm a little bit nervous about the, the M&A market right now, Dave, being kind of 
clueless because of the whole gut, blood gutting out of the of the overhype or the uh, not overhype the um, the overinvestment bubble that burst. You know, we're living in a tough market right now for funding in the capital markets. So, you know, it's like a bad it's like bad food poisoning. You got to just get it out of your system. And then ultimately, that's where we are in Silicon Valley right now. Um, the market is just toxic because well, of the overreaching and 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 frankly, the drinking from the trough. The, I mean, the shitload of money that was made over the past ten years has been incredible. So now everyone's got their got their numbers. The music stopped. Everyone's looking for a chair, musical chairs, kind of analogy. Um, it's going to take some time for this market to to reset. Uh, but the one shining bright light is the AI market on the startup side. So uh, I'm super pumped for that. That's definitely a tailwind. I mean, no I think doubt. it's a great time to start a company. But I, I interviewed a company yesterday, uh, a company called Apt Edge, and they've only raised $22 million. They started in 2018, and I was like, oh, basically, are you screwed like all those other companies that raised money in 2018 mm -hmm. and now can't do a B round or a C round? And they're like, no, actually, we got plenty of dough. We're not doing a raise right now. And to, but to th the fact is, because they, own, uh, you know, a quote unquote, only raised 22 million, you know, you've seen companies raised hundreds of millions of dollars, you know, unicorns. And so I'd much rather be in that position, you know, where expectations are, are, are reasonable and they've got traction now. You know, they got I think they got product market fit or they're close to it mm -hmm. and now they can scale. And so. I think it's a great time to act, to start a company, John. I, I really do. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm just watching our Twitter feed. We got we got two viewers, so we're okay. two viewers. <laughs> two viewers. <laughs> we're rocking it. We've been shadow banned. <laughs> <laughs> That's horrible. Well, so what are you gonna do? You got to start somewhere. Yeah, you know we're gonna win one viewer at a time. You know, well, I think I think Twitter, it's so, you know. so I was stoked to see that the the uh, breaking analysis. I got four viewers. Broke. Hey, look at that Twitter. Four viewers. Here you go. So no. breaking analysis. Tell your friends. Get let's get to ten. Elon so, Musk, where are you? So, so, but but I want to shout out to to the Cube Pod. So breaking analysis broke a million downloads last week, cumulative. Yeah. Yeah. And when I when I went back and looked at where the Cube Pod is relative to where breaking analysis was in its first six months, and Cube Pod's four X, where we were with breaking analysis. So I'm encouraged. It takes time to get this stuff going. I get great feedback from people. I mean, it was met, met with somebody last night. Said, "Hey, I love your." Your cube pod, you and John riffing it out, arguing with yeah. each other. East Coast, West Coast. You were the time. <laughs> I'm, in, I'm in my hoodie today because I'm behind. But um, Dave, I can't believe you're not wearing a tie. I'm going to post this uh, I know. topics topics on the Twitter That's here. Sad. That's sad. Can I tell? But um, yeah, I got a, I got a lot of shit to do. I got I'll be here late tonight. I got to pick up my son at the at the train station at midnight. So I'll be working all, right. all night. Well, I want to get into the whole. Um, there's a continuing investment in AI with GPUs. We're seeing uh, startups, just the challenge coming out the challenge NVIDIA, which in the spirit of AI, I got my NVIDIA cup right here. NVIDIA. Um, and then, of course, Amazon's already well into its chips and software. Amazon's in the race. Um, all this pointing to, and we've covered in detail, I know you, the research we've put out, you've put out personally on Intel and the chips my at God. Amazon, the ARM, oh the ARM, the ARM momentum, we called it out at AWS has been been discussed all the time on the cube but the uh, the deal this week that caught my attention was that intel fell apart with their their 4.5 billion dollar acquisition of tower semiconductor uh, the foundry yeah. so you know you've been on this from day one and we've been talking about it on the cube and you know um pat gelsinger might not be able to pull up intel else intel could go under i mean this is the iconic brand dave intel intel inside Fair. intel there's a possibility that Intel could go bankrupt. I just want to. I, 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 I just want to say. I mean, I mean. We, sometimes it sounds like we're rooting against Intel. We're not. Intel. The, the United States needs Intel to succeed. And number one, number two is. Look, we love Pat Gelsinger. I mean, he is an icon. He's an industry legend. He's a friend of the cubes, and I, we have deep, deep respect for him. But I just, I look at this. It, it's just the the news just keeps getting bad. I mean. They were celebrating and everybody, oh, you know, some of the analysts were high-fiving Intel's quarter and they beat expectations, but their revenues were like precipitously down. Okay, but they beat expectations because because PC strength and supposedly they gained share. Look at this, the problem is the same. First of all, the tower semiconductor deal would have been a good partnership for Intel, despite its cost, 
because it it gets them closer to two nanometer. Pat has said, we're going to get to two nanometer. We're going to leapfrog everybody and go right to two nanometer. And this is where, to your point, Intel could go bankrupt trying. So now they, they, they're going to have to partner with Tower Semiconductor, but it's better to own them. But the but the problem is the same. They are behind on, on, on wafer volumes. ARM has 10x the wafer volumes of Intel x86. And that is the fundamental problem. Everybody knows Moore's law. Let me just take a second. Theodore Paul Wright was an aeronautical engineer. He came up with Wright's law back in, I gotta look it up, but back in like the, in the early part of you know, last century, mid part of last century, he died in 1970. So Wright's law, it's really, ARK Invest has, a, has an interesting page on Wright's law. What is Wright's law? Pioneered by Theodore Wright in 1936, Wright's law aims to provide the reliable framework for forecasting cost declines as a function of cumulative production. In other words, it states that for every cumulative doubling of units produced, costs will fall by a constant percentage. Let's say in semiconductors, that's 15 to 20 percent. And that's really important because when you go to the next generation semiconductor, because volumes are much lower at the initial curve, you know, it's the learning curve. You, your costs are going to be higher until you surpass that volume. So if you can't double your cumulative volume, you can't cut your cost as, as, as dramatically. Well, ARM, because it doesn't make chips, it, sends, it, it, it licenses technology and sends them off to TSMC and Samsung, ARM wafer volumes are exploding. Now, Pat will admit he's behind on wafer, but he, he says, but we're leading on packaging on transistors, and that's where I call bullshit. You know who's leading on packaging? Apple, NVIDIA, Samsung, Tesla, even AMD. They're making smaller system on chip packages. And so, you know, like I said, Intel wants to go right to two nanometer and Tower Semiconductor was gonna help them do that. Getting foundry customers is a top priority for Intel. But the problem is the, the foundry customers that I've talked to who have, you know, gone there and stuck their toe in the water to say, uh, you know, it's, it's not ready. They have told me that Intel has probably got five years before it's going to be able to get the reliability and quality uh, that they need for these customers to trust them. So I, I don't know what to tell you, John. I mean, it's not a good story for Intel, even though, again, Pat is out telling, a, you know, putting on the, the, the bold face. He was in China, I don't know, last month trying to get this deal to go through. China ended up blocking the deal. But, you know, Intel, you know, continues to be in trouble, in my opinion. I, I am not. Do you think they optimistic. could go out? Do you think my statement that they could go out of business is legit? Yeah, I, I think in, Intel could go broke trying to compete in foundry. And I've said before, I think in my opinion, what Intel should do and should have done is split off the design from the manufacturing they should do a manufacturing deal with number two, which is Samsung. They should do a joint venture, base it in the United States, get the U.S. government to put some, some dough into it, reduce the reliance on for the industry on TSMC, and through that joint venture, use the Samsung expertise to try to get Apple's business, because that's the only fucking way they're going to be able to get volume to be able to compete with the volume and the economics that, that ARM has achieved. Yeah, I think I think the Intel inside generation from our old school, um, the X generation that grew up with PCs, and the boomers before us, um, was the PC, and now it's the cloud. If they don't get the cloud business, if they don't get the edge, the IoT and other things, they're toast, right? They have to get Apple. They got to get AWS. They got to get Google. They're buying servers in massive quantities. Um, they got the OEMs on the on the traditional side, so I think they'll do well in some of the data center plays, but um, they got to get the cloud. That's where the scale is. I totally Arm, agree with you. ARM designs are going to dominate at the edge. The edge is all about, it's about, about low cost, it's about low power, and it's about great performance. And, and, and ARM has the advantages in all of those. You think about, I hear Pat, I heard him on TV recently talking about NPUs, the neural processing unit. He said, yeah, we were a little bit behind on that. I mean, Apple's been doing this for five years. Tesla, you know, basically that's how Tesla got rid of LiDAR and, and is using cheap cameras, using the neural processing units that they, they basically programmed on their own. And so, again, the edge is going to be, the, 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 the winning play at the edge is going to be 
the the chips that have volume. So it's going to be it's going to be ARM based designs. You know what else? Broadcom, because Broadcom's doing all this connectivity. Hocktam will say, we don't do CPU, okay? Because we're not we can't dominate CPU, but we're going to dominate all the connectivity and all the cross you know connectivity between all these components. And so companies like that are going to win. And so, and I just, you know, I, again, I'm rooting for Intel, but I, I think that Pat has basically come out and said, it's an execution problem. And while Intel has had execution problems, I think the problems are more fundamental. And believe me, I perfectly understand Pat has forgotten more about the semiconductor business than I will ever, ever know, ever in 10 lifetimes. But can, can I just- count out, Can count out Gelsinger, but you know, right. the, the move to the government and playing in the national security card, Seems a little desperate to me, and I think Intel, um, and that's why people are dumping the stock. Well, they are desperate. Right. I mean, they are well, desperate. That's my 50, point. Fifty billion dollars from the U.S. government doesn't isn't going to do shit. I tell you, I'll tell you the other thing is if 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 the if I mean, frankly, Apple, Amazon, maybe you know, certainly the U.S. government, uh, uh, Microsoft, they could all write checks. Their balance sheets are such that they could write checks. Facebook could write checks. And actually, if they if they gave a shit about the you know U.S. competitiveness, they could write some big checks and funnel it to Intel. Maybe do that joint venture with with Samsung, entice Apple to do business with them because that's where all the volume is right now. Why do you think TSMC is so effective? It's because it sucks up all of Apple's volume, and so uh, it's just I, I mean I love the aspiration and I I listen to Pat very carefully. And he says all the right things, but I think there's a fundamental type A problem that they're facing. And I look, I'd love people to tell me I'm wrong. I mean, I do see analysts out there saying, hey, that was a great quarter. I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? Yeah, we, <laughs> you know? the, those analysts are getting paid, by the way, for Tainer to say nice things about them. We know who they are, and they're on TV doing it. Look, Intel's got problems. You know they're desperate when they're getting money. If they go to the Saudis to get money, you know the game's over, right? That's the That'll be the tell sign of Intel. Uh, and and they're they're hurting, and we want them to win. I love Intel. I think they're the oh they're, my God. they're like they're like Hewlett Packard to me. They're they're the they're the Silicon Valley story, um, the Silicon Valley Intel HPE HP the original HP. I got a book behind me. You can see right there. It's the Bill and Dave Packard. You know, management by walking around. I got that when I worked at HP. Um, great co great companies with great culture. Uh, Intel uh, uh, in, if Intel loses. Okay, that would be the sad moment. I think Pat Gelsinger should have been on earlier um, to save the company, but I think it may be too late. Yeah, I mean, I, I'll give you something else. So, so you know, we all know Moore's Law. When you do the math, you've probably heard me talk about this many times. When you do the math on Moore's Law, everybody says Moore's Law is dead. You do the math, it's like basically, you know, the doubling transistors every two years, whatever, doubling performance. It's about 40% annually performance improvement. It's a little less than that these days. But if you look at the combination, look what Apple's doing. Even you go back to the A15, which is, you know, A15 and A series inside your 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 smartphones. You look at the CPU, the NPU, the GPU, which it uses for the screen, uh, the accelerators inside of that, the annual increase in performance is over a hundred percent. You see so you compare that with 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 X86 annual improvements at 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 thirty percent or the forty percent even if you want to give them the benefit of the doubt, Apple was doing this five years ago. They were on that curve, yeah. And 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 they're using an ARM-based design with the with the M1 with the H A series. Amazon's on that curve with the Annapurna stuff, even though they're doing their own silicon. It's interesting to hear Hawk Tan talk about merchant silicon versus the in-house stuff. Obviously, Hawk Tan wants the in-house stuff, <laughs> but but or he wants the merchant stuff. He doesn't want people doing in-house. But but there are strategic reasons to do in-house silicon to be yeah. able to get on that curve and control your own destiny. And I, I again, I think Intel's five years behind. Could they somehow get to be the number two foundry by the end of the decade? I mean, I think I think if they did some radical moves to get the quality up and get Apple volume, you know, that would be awesome. I, yeah. I just think they get a long road, and I think it's a, the probability. I would put it less than 10%. Yeah. Well, I, let's hope that Intel, good analysis, Dave, as always. I'm surprised that, uh, you know, Intel doesn't doesn't um, make better moves, but we'll see. Um, we'll keep in touch oh, with those guys. It's making all the right moves. If, in fact, if you said, this is, this is your strategy, you have to execute this strategy, go. Pat Kelsinger is doing all the right things. But I think, 
I, I think there should be a discussion about is this the right strategy? You know, is this the right plan? And I don't think it's the right plan. I think the I, better I, plan I, is to split the company and do a JV with somebody who's got a foundry and is way further along than, I mean, Intel has foundry, but way further along than Intel foundry. Yeah, they got to carve a path to the future. I agree, and I think that's a good strategy. This Let's is where, the last thing I'll say is this is where Andy Jassy's quote about there's no compression algorithm for experience. More than any other market, it matters more in semiconductors. Yeah, you can't fake it till you make it there at all. It's one of those markets where you got to be on the right side of the trend line, and you got to do it years in advance, and you can't, like, just jump in. There's a tr this economies of scale, Dave, as you know. We, we talk about it all the time, um, that there's this, these diseconomies of scale in these markets. Speaking of diseconomies of scale, um, transitioning to the Databricks story, because I want to get to that, because um, the information has reported that they're doing another round of funding. Silicon Angle picked up on that news and reported it, but we still got more information. They didn't get it 100% right. The information is known for breaking stories. We've got a great organization over there. Jessica Lesson uh, has built out a great business. Um, you know, she's kind of in class of the cube. She started um, 10 years ago, a couple of years after we started. Um, modern kind of firm, doing good work, but they broke a story, but I don't think they got it right. They talked about. I was surprised when I saw that, John. I'm oh, like, what? This can't be right. That's this, not, it's, 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 it's this not. This is counter it's, to everything we know. What a bit of information we this have. This is the problem explain of getting. It, explain this, it, please. So first of all, it's not. First of all, they got a, they got the story. They're raising money, but they didn't get it right. And it's hard to get this right because it's very nuanced. When you when you do the kind of investigative that we do, we go deep in the trenches. We kind of know the story. And I'm glad they confirmed it because we can now talk about it. But the fact of the matter is, they are raising money, but they don't. They're not raising money because they need it, and not raising money because they're going to take a new beachhead that's that's the wrong story they're raising money because they can um databricks valuation was what 28 billion dollars roughly around that that during the peak of the market i would say it was even higher i would say it was closer to mid to high 30s bottom line is massive valuation they raise over a billion dollars in cash that's a lot of cash. and they're doing close to a billion in revenue so even if they're losing that much money they still have plenty of cash they don't right. need the cash. No, oh, the balance so, sheet is good, to your point. Right. So given this capital markets, the public markets sideways or and private markets, there's demand for the stock. So, you know, I always talk about this in Silicon Valley. When you have these hot companies like Databricks with a comp like Snowflake out there, if you're an investor, you go, hey, I can come in, get a valuation, given it's kind of a down market. If they went public today, there's no way they'd have that valuation. So there's probably a valuation reduction, hence not going public. Um, and so they got to get their fundamentals and stay private. Why would they go public? It's a smart move for Aligazi and team to stay private. They can do things like this. So, but if you're gonna, if you're a stockholder, an insider, an investor, an employee, and you sell stock into this kind of private secondary situation, you can make more bank. So I'll give you an example. Say you're an employee that started in the first couple of years, and your stock's options were worth the strike price of just using them a dollar, okay, mm -hmm. and now it's worth a thousand. <laughs> Okay, <laughs> and it's put, it was valued at ten thousand <laughs> on in the public market. You might might want to say, hey, you know, I want to buy that house. I want to take a couple million off the table. You sell ten thousand shares, uh, and you can get a thousand dollars for it a share or ten thousand a share. I'm using those numbers just to make a point. It's a shitload of money profit wise. You take some profits off the table and you roll the rest forward. And if they do go public, they can get that up. So if you're an employee, the company's should do a good job of getting some liquidity. So if you're an investor, you can bulk up a bunch of stock that you never had a chance to get before at a higher price, but you're betting on a step up on the public offering. Okay, that's what's happening here. It's Databricks, there's demand for the stock. Hell, I'd buy some stock if I could. But if you've got a hedge fund out there, Dave, you know this, we've discussed this on theCUBE many times. Yeah. If you're an investor and you've got you know, a couple hundred million, billions of dollars to play with, Databricks is kind of a sure thing. Um, so, and, so and at least at least in my mind, it's a sure thing. So explain this, John. So I mean, you know, VC one hundred and one is they're they're trying to get massive returns, one hundred x, certainly ten x, one hundred x, maybe even a thousand x, right? Yep. And they know most of their bets are going to fail, but they get you know some percentage, small percentage, but they're massive home runs. You know, Facebook, Uber. I mean, you know, the list the list goes on. And yep. those are the ones that they talk about, and and yep. those are the ones that make them famous. Hedge funds and private equity. Um, different story they'll come in much later to an investment and if they're getting 2x they're thrilled and because they they're put putting a, lot, in, a ton they put up they a lot massive of money. money right and so that's what's happening to your point is what's happening with databricks now so if databricks's last round was let's say let's call it 35 or 38 billion whatever it was and let's say now i can get in 
in the low 20. to mid twenties. And yeah. I could put in, I don't know, two, 200 million, 300 million. And, and if I'm a, if I'm a shareholder, like maybe I'm an employee and they want to get these guys liquid because yeah. you know, they didn't get to the IPO in the window. Hey, why not? I'll take yeah. some money off the table, lock it in. And then, so it's a win-win. Dave, and, just to put in comparison, Snowflake, a comparable, and we've and we've discussed the difference between Databricks and Snowflake. So as a betting person, you can say, hey, you know, first of all, Databricks is already a home run. That company has kicked ass. We've been following them since their existence. We know the founders, we've been all on Skew. But now they're like a darling, they're kicking ass. So the VCs already made their cash, probably cashed out. The employees can cash out, founders can cash out. This is a liquidity market, in my opinion. This is what goes on because the demand for the stock, even private, is huge. So the comparable stock that's public is Snowflake, okay? The, the symbol on the New York Stock Exchange is Snow. Love that, love that, love that ticker. One of my favorites. It's it's at one hundred and forty six dollars a share at forty seven billion dollars. So and it went point, out at one twenty, John. It was went went out at one twenty day one, doubled to close to two forty. At one point, it hit you know it was it was up, I think it hit four hundred at one point, and now like most stocks. I always tell people, don't buy it at the IPO. You'll get a chance to buy it close to where the the IPO price was. But still, it's it's above the high water mark the, was one one sixty. No, one ninety seven. What do you mean high water mark? What uh, the all time price, price per share? Yeah. No, no, all time was 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 much much higher than that. It was like it was four hundred. No, three three eighty seven. Uh, okay, know, almost four hundred. So so it was over a hundred billion dollars in value at one point. And but and and so yeah, that maybe was a little bit. I mean, over and, and, the top. And, and no, in twenty twenty one, November twenty twenty one, it went on a downward slide. It went as low as one twenty two. It's at one forty six. It's still higher than the valuation that someone could get in on Databricks. So the story that can't be confirmed because you know, no one's going to go on the record. But from sources close to the situation, I can tell you that there is interest. I can't say transactions happen. So the fact that information reported some funding um, validates our data that shows that there's demand for the stock but not at the price it's currently at so that means that there's liquidity that means there's demand and and hey david we were running a hedge fund we do it too because we love this company we think this oh, company if I could, yeah if you could get if into this if you could get into the databricks deal at a 20 billion dollar valuation yeah you would that's, you that's would a take no that chance that's an, that, i would definitely that's a bet that i would take given the fact that snowflake the comp is already high and assume that snowflake could even goes down which i doubt this this data market is booming I mean, I think there are some risks to the equity market. I mean, if if mm -hmm. if, if if interest rates are going to be, you know, higher for longer, like that makes equities less attractive. But I I I think you know, productivity is is how we get out of this problem. And if productivity doesn't go up because of AI, then you know, I guess we're all screwed. Yeah. So that story is good. So thanks for the information for cracking it. Um, and you, you can thank us later for clarifying. Uh, no need to send money. We appreciate that's what we do. Uh, <laughs> but but watch us. But 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 re retweet our uh, yeah. our live stream. We could yeah. use the help. <laughs> I know it's a, we got it all on the paywall. By the way, information is a paid service. They don't have a publication that's free, and they've done great with that. So yeah, I like that company. I like the, I like the team there. Uh, good. Team. I mean, if you have a paid service like that, you ha your yeah. shit has to be so good, right, to get people. And they their stuff's good. I gotta say, I, yeah. I think it's better than Business Insider. Oh, Business okay. Insider is kind of, um, you know, click, clickbaity. In, whereas Insider is ten times better than Business Insider. Yeah, but they're yeah, different. I mean, the they're information, different animals. Information, In, information yeah, yeah. had one goal, and that was to be. They're doing what they're doing. Be do the investigative journalism, break stories, be the source of of the scoops, and their scoop machine, and that's what they're built for. We, on the other hand, are data machines. So we are built to get the, the real story and deep dive and get the data. So we love working with them because they get the scoops. We we can add to our our puzzle. So we, you know, again, that validates what we know, and hence the report we just sent, which is Databricks is is doing some funding, but not because they need it, because they can. And that's the bottom line. Databricks. Well, and they're gonna, and, they, and, and they're get letting the letting people get liquid. You know, yeah. why why not taking some 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 money off the table? Why why not play with house money? Yeah. So, so, so about Cisco. So Cisco just had their earnings. We're going to get to VMware in a second with the event coming up next week. Um, they beat yeah. the estimates. Um, you were involved in the the whole circus of the earnings report. You had some inside um, view and access to the executives at the Cisco uh, earnings. Yeah. What did you learn? 
obviously a positive sign for spending. Cisco's on the rise again. We we analyzed that during the Cisco Live event. We had we weren't critical of them, but we were pretty bullish. And I think some of those things have panned out, Dave. Every bit of their business is firing on all cylinders, with two exceptions: collaboration, because you know the the COVID boom, and that's down. And security is not where Q2 Patel wants it. I mean, security business is flat, and you know security should be growing. So, but but my, I look at that as a positive. Cisco is kicking ass. They're, they were 15 billion uh, 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 revenue quarter, grew 16 percent. So their top line is growing, and their bottom line is growing faster than the top line. And they basically said, "We're gonna we're gonna commit long term toward operating leverage, meaning our 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 bottom line is gonna continue to grow more than our top line." And the reason is because they're in increasing the contribution from software, you know, much much about tens of billions, $20 billion plus software business. Their remaining performance obligations are enormous. And so they have much better visibility on their business. And, and it was interesting. So last night, as I was getting on the phone with some of the execs to talk about the quarter, just after they released the quarter, I saw, I saw the stock was down. And there was a headline at Barron's, and I tweeted it out. Um, I'll have to pull it up here. But, and, and so the, the, the headline was negative. You know, Cisco gives, here it is right here. Cisco, oh, this is the new headline. The new headline is Cisco stock rallies on rebounding orders by Eric Savitz. The original headline, same article, was here, I'll, I'll pull it up right here, was, was negative, basically saying, you know, the stock is down or, the, uh, or the, the guidance was down. So the stock was down like 3% after hours. This is the rebound one, rallies on rebound? Yeah, uh, yeah, so, so, so the earlier headline on Barron's, which was changed by this guy, Eric Savitz. And he changed know, the I know, I know Eric. I know Eric. He's a Palo Alto dad. Yeah, he's he cool. does good work. He's good. But, yeah, no, he is good. But, you know, he probably heard, he probably heard, you know, bad news or whatever. And so I said to, to, the, to the executives, I'm like, wow, your stock's down. And they go, what? We're doing high fives here. You know, we're, gonna, we're kicking ass. And uh, I'm like, really? I don't know. Maybe they got the story wrong. Well, sure enough, when I jumped on the conference call, they were super upbeat, and all of a sudden the stock started to go up. And then, lo and behold, Barron's changes the headline to Cisco stock rallies on rebounding orders. So what? So what happened? Did they get it wrong? Yeah, yeah, they got it wrong. I mean, they misinterpreted the guidance, and so the guidance was, I think, prudent. I don't, I don't, I wouldn't even say it was conservative. I mean, there was so much more good news, throwing off tons of free cash flow. The gap EPS was, uh, I mean, it was just. You know, I mean, really a strong year, great mm -hmm. free cash flow, great margins, you know, mm -hmm. and somewhat conservative guidance, but not really. I mean, you know, pretty prudent guidance, in my opinion. So that was pretty amazing. I've never seen a sort of a turnaround like that. In fact, you could see the stock price. It went down 3%, and then it was up like 4% after hours. And I think it closed probably just before they opened today, you know, 2%. And what did it close today? It must have been up today. What's the stock do today? Cisco was up three percent today, three and a half percent today, almost. So, pretty wild. Um, it's interesting. Yeah, so, I, talk about market caps. HPE is only a twenty-one billion dollar company. Cisco's at two hundred two hundred twenty-three billion, which means that Snowflake's valued more than HPE. So, do you want to hear something amazing? It's kind of uh, off topic, but it's it's just insane. Yeah. Um, so I'm prepping for breaking analysis tomorrow. Uh, Zias Caravalla is coming in studio, and Zias, Rob, and I, Rob Streche, are going to do a breaking analysis. So I'm going to. So the 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 working title here is VMware's future: navigating multi-cloud complexity and Gen AI under Broadcom's wing. So I pulled out, you know, what Broadcom said they were going to do with VMware. They said they're going to, you know, put 8.5 billion of pro forma EBITDA contribution. I got some some thoughts from Hawk Tan. And I did a Broadcom and VMware, just a very simple financials. Uh -huh. Broadcom is insane. Broadcom's a $34 billion company with 20,000 employees. It's got 67% gross margins, and it's mostly a, you know, a semiconductor company. Its EBITDA margin is 58%, and its free cash flow margin is 49%. Its revenue per employee is $1.7 million per employee, and it's got a $343 billion market cap, 10x revenue. VMware is a $13 billion company. It's got 
8,000 employees. So it's got $350,000 revenue per employee, which by the way, for a software company is pretty good. But VMware's worth VMware's worth more than that market cap. It's like thirty something. Isn't no, it? sixty-seven billion is the market oh, cap. But oh. it's got thirty-eight thousand employees on a on a on a revenue of thirteen uh, billion. So its revenue per headcount is three hundred and fifty thousand, which is good. But compared to Broadcom's one point seven million yeah. per employee, it's just it it it's just blows you away to see how profitable so, so, Broadcom is. So we're on the we're on the eve of next week is VMware's annual conference formerly known as VMware Explore, uh, mm -hmm. VMware, VMworld, now called VMware Explore, will be there, second year they use the new name. Broadcom buying out VMware, there's speculation that that's going to be announced at the show, something is going to be no. their year-end. No, it, it won't be at the show. I know, I, 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 yeah. I know, I was just saying, some are saying, we're saying it's going to, it's going to be shifted out. Um, but I think maybe but there's, November. But there's, but there's breaking November. news, there's breaking news right now, Broadcom secures $28 billion debt financing for the VMware buy, so they just secured the financing. Now you remember, Dave, that they, they when they did the deal, they secured a bridge loan for thirty-two billion that they entered right. into the deal with. So they now have secured the debt financing. Okay, and so this is being reported as we speak. Um, Two minutes ago. Wow. Yeah, okay. So so yeah, it's popping. So we're rocking and rolling with some breaking news here on our live. <laughs> our first streaming to Twitter on our podcast, which we'll do more of, by the way, and get it to Twitter spaces as well. We'll figure this out, but um, and we'll ship the podcast tomorrow as, as normal cadence. Um, but we'll do we'll do the live. But so retired is, some earlier debt. Um, yes. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So. There's another, yeah, and 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 what Broadcom's going to do is they know they're going to delever. They obviously have to reduce headcount. I mean, Business that's... Insider wrote a story that we covered a few weeks ago that they're going to gut VMware on the acquisition. Um, I I found out that people got letters. Some didn't get letters, so they already know who's going to stay or go. But I think it, I think that Broadcom and my, if I had to make a bet, knowing from the sources that were out there, um, what I'm hearing is that um, Broadcom is going to say, "Okay, let's see let's see you guys work for a couple quarters," and you and you actually called this out on your first memo. But that's actually happening. You you actually got it right, Dave, when you and when you published your first, and you got it right to the T, basically. And I think Broadcom's very metric oriented. Okay, you got a business plan, put it out there, hit the numbers, we go. If not, you're gone. I think they're very much like that, which is why people give them a lot of shit for their management style. But the stock is off the charts. Oh, it's unbelievable. Octan <laughs> yeah. will say, "I've got what well, I think it's 17 business units, and they're all independent business units, and they got to perform." And I think that he's just going to make VMware an independent business unit. It's going to it's going to make Broadcom fifty percent software, which, by the way, I don't really think he gives a shit. I don't think he has some vision of I'm going to be half software, half. I don't think he cares. I think he just wants to have great businesses that have a sustainable advantage, where they have leadership, and they have a they have a big install base. And I and everybody everybody says they're going to raise prices, which is probably true. But I think the strategy is not that simple. It's not as simple as we're going to raise prices. I think the strategy is going to be buy more and you'll pay less. And so if you make bigger commitments. Hey, that sounds like Jensen at fucking Yes, Infinity. yes. Hey. If you make bigger commitments to VMware, Save more. we're going to give you the best deal. Yeah. And if you don't make bigger commitments, if you make smaller commitments, we're going to increase your price. So there's a, there's a, here's the business case. Yeah. Now, the, the key for Broadcom is – they got to continue to invest in a very focused way, and that's what they've done. They they direct R and D in a, like a laser focused way. They cut out all the bullshit and all the experimentation and all that stuff, and they just drive customer value on a roadmap. And they execute like crazy. And if they don't, Octan shoots them, and then you're out. I think I just and, dropped and an F. The I think I just dropped an F bomb in my excitement of Broadcom's activity. Um, they are so freaking awesome right now with their stock. But the thing about VMware that's going to be critical to them is that vSphere is just a cash cow. And if I'm Broadcom, I've got to worry about the renewal cycle because here's the psychology of the VMware customer. I'm sure Broadcom's all over this, so um, um, they've probably got a handle on it. But if I'm Broadcom, if I'm advising Hawk Tan, Hawk, if you're listening, here's, here's, the, here's what you got to watch out for blind spot. VMware's got a lot of shelfware in their system. They got great products. We got vSAN, vSphere, killer products. They have a lot of other stuff that their customers get. If they don't install that, it's what they call shelfware. It's sitting on the shelf, hasn't been deployed. That's what they call shelfware in the vernacular of the software business. If I'm if I am 
Broadcom. I want to keep the SEs. I want to keep the field employees getting the customers to keep the installations of the shelfware going because that's another license renewal. Because if I'm a VMware customer, okay, I'll pay the tax on vSphere. I'll pay for it. But you know what? I'm not going to renew that other stuff. That would be a huge impact to the dollar. So I would be very focused on from a, from a hedge perspective and also business fundamentals perspective to say, get that shelfware installed. We need it in there to make sure that we have the hooks into the customer. And then we bring more Broadcom love to the table with chips and they can get in there. That silicon innovation. I, I said from day one, and I might be wrong, but I might have to eat my words, but I said from day one that Broadcom's chip leadership, because the stack, we've called it the super stack, super chips, super computing, super cloud, super apps. If I'm, I want that integration up into the app. I got to have more off, offloading to silicon, a lot of these application specific things in the platform. And I think that's a huge opportunity for Broadcom with VMware. If they're not thinking that, then then they got, then they're in it for just the cash, as you pointed out. So I think, you know, the debate is, are they in for the cash cow or are they, am I overthinking it, Dave, on this? So, but get the shelfware installed, get the installs in there, increase the license on the renewals, get those renewals with more, more, more elements versus just people downsizing the VMware or right-sizing VMware. So, I mean, as amazing a job as Gelsinger did with VMware, a lot of it was sort of a shell game where he was buying companies. I mean, an example of that is Carbon Black. You remember, um, he remember he was on the cube that the, when when they announced the Carbon Black acquisition, he said, you know, I'd paid what two point three billion dollars for Carbon Black, and here's CrowdStrike with a thirty billion dollar valuation. I think I got just as good a product for way less money. I'm not sure, um, and so. I've talked to CISOs who are carbon black customers, like I'm really nervous. I'm nervous that you know VMware is gonna jettison carbon black, which they very well may do. I, I don't know. Uh, but the, so that's the question is, is 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 VMware, can they be, you know, number one or number two, Jack Welch, in security? I mean, obviously they have to have security, but can they monetize security the way that Hawk Dan is gonna require? And if they can't, he'll do, you know, like Michael Dell. They sold off a bunch of assets from the EMC acquisition and he delevered de and that's how they got rid of the debt. And, and, and Hawk Tan has said, we are going to delever. So the question is, okay, what's he going to sell? He's not going to sell vSphere, you know, of course, you know, I think, I no think way. he has to keep, he has to keep vSphere. Right. That's the of cash course. cow. So he's going to take the cash cow vSphere and he's going to look at all of the, the relevant components around that vSAN, NSX and say, okay, what's making us money? You know, what's shelfware? What's making us money? If it's shelfware, you got, I don't know, you got two quarters to make us money or else you're gone. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, and he's got tech. That tech is, 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 he can turn it into liquid assets and put it right on his balance sheet. And they, they've done this so many times before. I do think it's different. Everybody's comparing it to the CA and Symantec, the CA in particular. It was like mainframe software. You know, VMware, is so relevant and look at the etr survey data uh, prepping for breaking analysis if you look at the 1700 or so etr respondents 50 percent have vmware installed so their presence is enormous the overlap in between <laughs> it shops and vmware is huge you're probably surprised it's only 50 percent <laughs> right and so so they're they're a critical component they're like air you know <laughs> you don't just unhook VMware, where are you going to yeah, go? Yeah, yeah you know? exactly. And by the way, the VM VM migration, the virtual machine migration to cloud native services is happening, but it's not happening at massive scale. It's not like it's it's extinct. It's a, it's not like it's going to be extinction. It's kind of like it's kind of like climate change, Dave. You know, you, you think it's going to happen, but you don't know when. You, <laughs> you know, the polar <laughs> ice caps are melting. So VMware is a locked and loaded killer business model. They've been. It's the gift that keeps on giving. Look at the uh, 13 years we've done VMware. VMworld and now VMware Explorer. Every year, Dave, vSphere, the core virtualization product, that is the core, it runs operations in IT. IT is changing. Broadcom knows that. They see the, the OEM data. They know what's going on with the machines and the hardware from data center, cloud to edge. They see the software stack changing. They're not dumbasses. They see VMware as an asset from a cash flow perspective. And if you strip out all the other stuff around VMware, it's got the crown jewel. And it's been that way for 13 years. Look at all the stuff they've tried to introduce. Software-defined data center. Well, guess what? Is NSX going to hang around? We'll see. Well, if that's going to be 
part of, I have to buy into NSX to get this? Project Monterey, you asked about that last week on the podcast. Well, if it's tied to NSX, it might not work because maybe people, not everyone's going to use NSX. Okay, so yeah, again, I mean, you know, when I, you get, I mean, when I, you, yeah. <laughs> as, a, as a company, you kind of tie things together. But if you're Broadcom, you go, give the customer choice. So but, I, I think, but, I, but I do think Coctan wants growth, and I think he's betting on multi cloud. So that's what's going to be super cloud. It's going to be interesting to see if they can, if they can monetize that cross cross cloud complexity. I mean, VMware is in a good spot to do that, as good a spot as anybody, because they got VMware cloud on AWS. So they got and they got you know similar products on all the other clouds. They've got v, uh, VCF uh, VMware Cloud Foundation mm -hmm. for pri you know private cloud stuff, and they're ubiquitous. So they can yeah. connect the dots and and yeah. and solve some management problems, inject AI into for IT ops. You know yeah. they that's a that's a that's a pretty good play in my opinion. But VMware of all the years that they've had any good story, I thought that the past couple of years they're on a trajectory. They bought Heptio on the cloud native side. Ragu has sharpened his saw in there. He was getting the job done. They had the playbook getting laid down for this kind of next gen cloud, and Broadcom came in at the right time. So it'll be it'll be sad to see Broadcom if they gut it. But VMware did have a lot of overhead, and the other businesses may or may not have been doing well without the lift of VMware headquarters. You know, main the main boat. So the main boat is the cash cow. And then, so that did carry a lot of stuff around VMware. If Broadcom can nurture that trajectory, they could be a leader in the cloud native world. They had everything going in the right direction. They had a deal with AWS. They'd gone to multi-cloud, cross-cloud services. That story is resonating. Does it have enough teeth? It may, if they cut it, we would never know. It never gave it time to run, right, or grow. So do they chop that out early? Does that, do they give it enough room to run or grow? Are they throwing the baby out with the bathwater, whatever you want to call it? That's the challenge that Broadcom has. Yeah, they, gotta, I, they gotta know, do, do they give it enough chance they just fish or cut bait? I think you're right on on that, John. I mean, if you think about it, I mean, I mean, the partnership with with Red Hat, you know, they kind of, their partnerships are kind of funny, Red Hat and VMware, they kind of, they need each other, but they kind of, you know, compete. <laughs> and, and you know, over, let's face it, OpenShift is, is the product. You know that is the the container service, the container platform. That it, it's got probably got at least half, maybe more, of the revenue in that market. The market share is is OpenShift, and you know VMware wants to compete with that, but you know, OpenShift is more mature. It's got way better traction. You know it's working. It's it's successful. It's ubiquitous. So we'll, we'll you know, be maybe we'll, we'll, we'll be there next week in Vegas. We're going to yeah, be on the ground. Good. We're going to be deep in the bowels of in the in the trenches, deep in the throat of AWS, VMware, uh, all the partner ecosystem. I mean, VMware's ecosystem is amazing. They have a community event. By the way, a sticker was spotted in the wild, uh, and I put on Twitter a super cloud sticker was spotted on a laptop in Palo Alto <laughs> with <laughs> cloud um, cloud expert program. I'm getting tattoos, so, I heard. So, so you know, they have the V experts. Yeah, you know, Fitzy says we should get super cloud tattoos. That would make it real. He basically he said if we get super cloud tattoos, he's going to capitulate. Yeah, it's yeah, real. Yeah. No, he wants it on the all over the face of my my face. So, yeah, the, so, the, the Mike Tyson tattoo. Yeah. <laughs> he's great. I love Fitzy. I, I get, but you know, you know, I'd get a cube tattoo at this point. Thirteen years doing the cube. I mean, I might get go. a cube tattoo. First one to get a cube tattoo gets VIP status forever. Um, there you go. Lot, but lot, by the I, way. By the way, quick aside, uh, Forrester put out a report, the future of cloud. Cloud becomes abstracted, intelligent, and composable. This is July 2023. Yeah, sounds like super cloud. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Cut and paste that report and call it super cloud. Yeah. Well, I think everyone wanted to know the definition. It's funny. Fitzy's, you know, tongue in cheek because he's playing the game. He's a, he's a blogger. He knows the game. Um, but he kind of guessed that we're onto something. That's why the more he says it's not a thing, the more it's a thing. So that, that means they're doing that it's becoming an industry thing. And and what he doesn't understand is is that when we when we started doing super cloud, we wanted to make an open conversation. The whole idea was our original discussion at reInvent 2021, was that was yep. it 2021? Um, yep. when we identified that super cloud abstraction, whether the success of Snowflake, it didn't fit into a mold. It didn't fit into a, a, a peg that was industry standard, it was different. So we talked about Snowflake, Databricks. And since then, if you look at the stock prices and value of Snowflake and Databricks, MongoDB since that time, it's been huge. So we, we are right on SuperCloud. Number two, 
we didn't want to have to do a lot of research and like go away and make up something like what Gartner does. We Gartner's just now getting to 2022 market share, Dave. So <laughs> like so you know uh, the, the, that the, kills the, me. That the kills research me. the research people aren't that good anymore, right? So like in terms of getting stuff fresh and relevant. So we felt SuperCloud's better to be discussed publicly. And look what happened. IDC yeah, does where, though. IDC does a way better job on on data than yeah. Gartner. I mean, they, they, they market, own that. Their market share focus. I get that. Yeah. And they got that. And they get the thing. But but the thing is, is that it's it's been showing that people in the ecosystems are changing. I think if you if you look at all the transformations happening in the market right now, the number one thing that's becoming a table stakes feature is if you're a platform and that's your strategy and you're a company, whether you're a big old incumbent or a new rising star, if you don't have an ecosystem, you're nothing. Because that's the proof points, the social proof, the business proof that you have a business. If you have an ecosystem or uh, a constituency that can validate what you say you do, then you're real. You're, otherwise, if you don't have that, you're fake. We see it all the time. People say, I have this, but they're fake. They're faking it. Well, this is and, where and, th – go ahead. Sorry. Yeah, I mean, so you can't fake community. You have to show it. you got to prove it. Just the proof is in the pudding, as they say. So, well, you know, when you get that, if you, if you, you, you can't produce an ecosystem partner network, then you're not a platform. You're a and company. The, and, and this is, I think, the challenge for HPE with GreenLake, with Dell, with Apex, certainly with VMware and its and its its cloud strategy. If in order to compete with the public clouds, and let's face it, yeah. they do compete with the public clouds. Yes, I know. I know Matt Baker will say it's not a zero sum game, and I agree that it's not a zero sum yeah. game. But look at a dollar spent in cloud means it's not going to yeah. be spent on prem, and well, so you got to find new incremental growth like super cloud. But I will say this: if you look at how far behind from an ecosystem build out standpoint the traditional incumbent, you know, on prem incumbents are, it's a big deal, and this is where. The Gen AI thing gets kind of interesting, right? On the one hand, the clouds have, they got the optionality, they have all the different, you know, Gen AI LLM partners, yeah. they have, you know, sort of building off a of SageMaker, they've got the, the silicon, they've got, you know, the database, the data platforms, they've got the governance partners, it's you know, on and on and on. You look at what the on-prem guys have, they basically... You know they they're they're yeah. still at the reference architecture phase where they're announcing like HPE they've announced LLM as a service which is great not available to the end of the year so they got a lot of work to do now here's what I'll say they also have an advantage and the advantage is latency right <laughs> and and IP protection so they they don't have to be equivalent functionally to the cloud but they've got to close the gap. And but they they got to do it before the cloud figures out how to make things like Outpost and Anthos, you know, as functional as w what Apex and and GreenLake envision. That's exactly why I think VMware's ecosystem is a huge deal for Broadcom and potentially yeah. its OEM customers. So mm -hmm. Broadcom makes money from OEM customers and end user customers through their acquisitions. So you know they're chip they're a semi company, okay, um, but they have other businesses that they're diversifying into. They're a huge conglomerate now. So the brilliance and they're of, enterprise, by the way, they're enterprise. They're not yeah. consumer. Yeah, right. exactly. An enterprise with mainframe stuff all the way into chips. If they're smart, they could be the white knight with VMware's ecosystem by using that ecosystem as a galvanizing force for Dell's, the HPs, of the, which, by the way, they're customers. So again, that's again my weird vision of this is that if I'm Broadcom, I can bring an ecosystem presence instantly to my customers who are buying chips. Which have supply chain challenges, which are always, you know, price sensitive, always being smaller, faster, cheaper. Like you said, that's you gotta be in that business. You can't fake that business. Broadcom kicks the kicks butt on that business. And, and you know what, Sean? It's it is like the fourth cloud. This is why Lena Khan should just just like just, just let the deal go through and get out of the way. Because think about it, the ecosystem partners, they want they want an option other than AWS. You know, Microsoft's competing with most of them, much of its ecosystem. Google's, you know, behind, even though Google's, you know, you got great tech. You know, VMware is really a great ecosystem partner. And the ecosystem of, you know, AWS's ecosystem wants, for the most part, maybe not the Databricks or maybe not Snowflake is born in the cloud, but much of the ecosystem wants VMware to be viable. And, you know, the, the, the regulators are making it uh, like 
well, what about that fiber channel over Ethernet card? You know, Broadcom could really screw people on that. So who cares? I mean, it's yeah. just such yeah. nonsense. The bigger picture is how do you how do you compete with the cloud, the big three hyperscalers, which have all this capex, all this money, and VMware is a viable competitor to those you know big three clouds. So speaking of Lena Khan, we got her into the into the conversation. So oh. she's I think she's too busy um, picketing. So just reported she's um, was picketing. She joined the Writers Guild of America. Um, and joined a picket line outside the View Studio in New York City. So the red flags um, she sees in the showbiz. You're, you're kidding me. So she's like now focusing on show business. So yeah, you, you got to be shitting me. She's like the. You you're know, making this up. No, it, I swear to God, it's being. It's uh, there's an article on a Substack called The Ankler. Um, she she essentially uh, joined um, the Writers Guild of America in New York City uh, for a picketing. She is. So there she is. So. Um, m a future for hollywood i mean they're on strike i mean she's just like anything to do with blocking it so maybe she's distracted and vmware could sneak this through and say see you later i predicted on the podcast by the way they're going to just get it done and say oh, we'll pay the fine i mean what's the fine what's the fcc going to do this is a tough one right this is a tough one aren't there isn't the writer's guild i mean i i do sympathize with with the writers but like part of their demand isn't some of their demands like you can't use ai <laughs> i mean hello that's never going to happen, right? And so yeah, I, don't, mm, I, mean, I don't know how this one's going to end. Well, the content rights are issues. We Again, we said this on the pod. We'll say it again. There's three things going on right now that's, that's historic, at least in my lifetime that I've ever seen. The innovation of the tech is exploding with AI, the infrastructure, next-gen cloud. The stuff that we can do right now as entrepreneurs and technologists to build new things is better than it's ever been in my lifetime, our lifetime. So it is an amazing, if you're in your 20s or in your teens and you're not riding this big wave, big surf, that's technology, um, then you're not gonna be an entrepreneur. But if you like that stuff, this is the, the perfect environment. The problem is there's two other things going on that are also blockers in the perfect storm here. That is legal issues arising, new like rights to the content. If I use chat, where does that come from? There's a data supply chain, there's a software supply chain, there's a, a hardware supply chain. So there's a lot of legal, entanglements involved in the new shit. The third one is compliance. So there's regulations, as you know, GDPR was done years and years ago. So you have all these old regulations that were built for older times. So you have a new renaissance here going on with technology and a Cambrian explosion at the same time. So huge tailwind for entrepreneurship, huge tailwind for industries. Every single industry, Andy Jassy said that he's exactly right. It is a massive builder culture, open source, entrepreneurship, it is the best time to start a company without a doubt. The problem is, is that that could get screwed by these other factors that have nothing to do with that. That if they just threw it away, threw the book away and rebuilt it, it would be okay. So, you know, the guild is protecting rights, but that was stuff that was written down from intellectual property rights from prior digital generations. Okay. FTC still is implementing, you know, the, the act from 1995. So, the modernization of policy in society is not leveled up to technology, and that's a huge problem. Well, and even the leaders in Silicon Valley and the tech industry are, 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 are not amplifying that point and putting leaders in place that could help protect the people and the artists. Because the artists are right on one hand, they should be protected, but they don't know what the solution is. Yeah, and so, I, I don't, and I don't blame the artists. I mean, the, 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 the studios made a shitload of money during the pandemic. And now, of course, they're all raising prices, right? You see all these, like everybody's raising prices, like big, big price increases, because and the cord cutters are going to get hosed, right? Because how many, how many streaming services do you have? Do you even know? I, I buy them all. I got them all too, and I'm like, I don't know. I every, love it. Every month I do too, but every month I get this uh, this bill. I'm like, geez, I'm paying a lot. Did I even, did I even use Hulu this month? I don't know. Mm -hmm. <laughs> someone should, make, have a, it just someone should make a service like you know manage your subscription with a dash, single pane of glass it's you know, one, there. one service well dave this is the point i mean i was i was clicking on my my other tv which is xfinity which has its own smart tv little arrow in it i clicked right. on tubi by accident and i forget if tubi was a rebrand of aws let's see tubi tubi um uh, own owner so it's fox i think owns tubi okay um 
They bought right. Yes, Fox. Fox you can't even keep a track of it anymore. So, it's like... <laughs> I think Amazon uh, IMDb was renamed into something else. But but the point is, I clicked on it and like, oh, I want, oh, I'm like, oh, this is cool, a new menu. I'm just curious as a as a you know in the media business with digital, I want to see what's got going on the layout. So you know, my my runs yelling at me and get up, get be the clicker. I'm like surfing around. I clicked on live TV. I'm like, oh, live TV. And in their menu, they're also getting over the top live TV, either over the air or somewhere else. And I watched a women's soccer game on on a women's sports channel. So there's all these new channels opening up. So I think there's going to be a huge content explosion. Okay, um, everything will be televised in the future. Everything from little league to movies to tech, everything's going to explode with video. And no doubt in my mind that the Cube will be the tech TV channel, um, and others and uh, and there'll be enterprise tv there'll be analyst tv there'll be everything on tv uh, every vertical will have it just like we see in sports nhl's got a channel nmlb nfl so very the, focused um, vertical media is here the, and it's not going to go away the the wall street that's an article i read this the other day i just scanned it they're calling it streamflation right you got yeah, hulu's love, going hulu's going up to 17.99 a month and hulu's Freaking well, who's okay? Max fifteen ninety nine, Netflix fifteen forty nine. I think Netflix is the best. Netflix and Prime, Disney thirteen ninety nine, Peacock eleven ninety nine, Paramount eleven ninety nine, Apple TV six ninety nine. Apple TV, you know, they get the shittiest platform, which is surprising. To Apple, I mean, the things just it's so non intuitive. But Hulu at seventeen ninety nine, you 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 watch Hulu. I watch Hulu. It's just okay. Right, you know, well, content's just okay. Netflix hey, is good. We are we're out of time. We're, we're at the we're over. <laughs> we're, 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 no. over we're over the hours. Um I guess we got a lot of rants in there. Um we got a big week coming up. We got Google Next after VMware Explorer. Uh and then we got uh, some events going on after that and then uh, the fall's here. Any I just final? got an interesting text from somebody. It's from Floyer. Apple is nearing three nanometer volume. So remember Intel wants to leapfrog and go to two nanometer. Apple's nearing three nanometer volume production for iPhone. TSMC only charges for working chips that are 100% to spec. So it's like his point is they're so far ahead yeah. in the race. Anyway, our, 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 might, our might buy Intel out of bankruptcy. That's the controversial last tweet. Is Intel doomed? That's the question. Next, we didn't uh, get to uh, the HashiCorp open source. Next time we'll do that. We said we we're going to do that last time. So uh, we'll see you next time. This is episode 25, a historic live stream to Twitter, our first one. Uh, Dave, we got that working. We'll try to get spaces going. Next time we'll do a simulcast there. We can always do YouTube. LinkedIn Live's a pain in the ass to work with. We'll try that another time. But, you know, 25 episodes were off up and to the right on audience. Um, if you like the podcast, let us know. Drop us a note. I'm John Furrier, Dave Vellante. Let us know how you think. Share it with your friends. Give it a like on iTunes and Spotify. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. Go to SiliconAngle.com for all the traffic and all the content. See you next time. See you next week, John. All right. Bye.